church, if you would, open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. Next week we will pick up the uh, sermon series that we were going through together, Stuff Every Christian Should Know. But uh, today's a special day. It's January the 1st, a new year. And you know what that means. New Year's resolutions. You know, fresh start, positive direction, a renewed vision, new beginning. But how often do our self-made plans seem to fall apart before we ever really get going? You know, that, that road map to prosperity and productivity, it, it ventures off trail somehow along the way. Fact is, sometimes in order to really have a good year, even a good week for that matter, all you really need is just to find the right person with the right instruction. Well, when that moment of need comes, who are you going to call? So, Tom Holland, the guy that lived in Holland, Michigan, I'm sorry, Tom Quinn of Holland, Michigan, he had a problem. Uh, he writes this. He said, my old laptop simply wouldn't run the Mac Bible software anymore, though I had exper experimented with it for hours. Nothing worked. My wife suggested that I call the owners of the software for help, but no. I knew what I was doing. Finally, after having exhausted every last idea, I gave in and I called the Mac Bible Corporation. I was assured that the person to whom I was being referred would know exactly what to do. I wasn't convinced, but I called him anyway. And he gave me a brief set of instructions, and in minutes, my computer software program was up and running. Uh, the man's name sounded oddly familiar, and I soon realized why. The person on the other end of the line was none other than the man who had written the software. All I had needed to do was just go to the man who wrote the program. Well, you see, church, when our best laid plans seem to go awry, remember who we need to call for assistance, the one who actually wrote life's instruction manual. Now, verse 26 here in, in Genesis chapter 4 says that, at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Now, before we unpack what that verse is really saying to us, let me give you a little bit of context for this passage. First uh, half of the chapter of chapter four of Genesis, it documents the first murder in the history of mankind. That's when Adam's son Cain killed his brother Abel. Now, the second half of Genesis chapter four, it's kind of a a juxtaposition of the family lines of Cain and Adam and Eve's third son, Seth. And what this contrast reveals is that humanity's path was split as Cain's family pursued sin and vengeance, while Seth's family pursued God. And the truth that's really on display here is that because of the fall of man in Genesis Humankind's paths have diverged here, leading us either toward God or further away from God. But you see, chapter 4 ends with this little postscript there in verse 26 when it says, At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, it's not possible for us to, you know, 100% know everything that's implied in the text there, but we can assume that. Here in verse 26, a new beginning was made. Now, this may actually be a reference to, you know, a, an act of dedication to God in which the descendants of Seth set themselves apart for God. Or it may simply indicate the very beginning of the offering of prayers to God by humankind. Or it may actually be both. But here's the big idea, really, that I want you to get from this verse, that we would all do well to begin each year, really to begin each day by calling upon the name of the Lord. So this morning I want to discuss the prayers of new beginning. The prayers of new beginning. There's four of them I want to talk about this morning. And the first one is this, the prayer of gratitude. The prayer of gratitude. It's a prayer of thanksgiving. Why a prayer of thanks? I'll give you three, uh, three reasons to ponder this morning. The first one, because God's Word commands it. God's Word commands it. 
Uh, Psalm 100, verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Ephesians 5, 20, give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Colossians 3.17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So, we give thanks, we pray that, pr that, we pray that prayer of gratitude because God's word commands it. But here's another reason. We also give thanks because God's character demands it. We pray that, pray of, uh, we pray that prayer of thanks because of his character. Now, we don't have time to explore everything involved you know, with, with God's character, but I think the first and, and most obvious is that God is loving. Perhaps the most outstanding feature of all of God's character traits is that he is a loving father to all believers. So he's loving. We also know that God is good. Psalm 106, 1, praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Church, his, his goodness is unmatched. And because of it, we can trust in him. Uh, Nahum chapter 1, verse 7, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. 1 Peter 5, 7 to, uh, says to cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. You see, in God's goodness, he always has your best interests at heart. And we see that uh, displayed vividly in Romans 8, 28, uh, 8, 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. So everything that God does is an expression of his goodness. And it's designed to benefit his people. God is loving. God is good. Here's another one. God is faithful. We thank him for his character trait of faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And you know, even in, in those instances when we stumble and fall, it's immensely encouraging to know that God will never abandon us. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you, the Bible says. Even when we are utterly unfaithful, God remains faithful and true because that's who he is. It is God's character to be faithful. And you know what? We're only scratching the surface. Yes, God is loving. He is good. He is faithful. Um, God is holy. He is just. He is merciful. He is righteous. He is compassionate, gracious, kind. He is patient. God is long-suffering. So there's a lot of things about God that we have to thank him for. So God's word commands our prayer of gratitude. God's character demands our prayer of gratitude. But then here's the third thing. God's works nourish it. His works nourish our attitude of gratitude. There was a song that came out uh, roughly 30 years ago. There's a worship leader named Dennis Jernigan. And he wrote this, this beautiful song, very simple melody, very simple words, but it expresses the type of attitude we should live with every day. It's called Thank You, Lord. It says, for all you have done, I will thank you. For all that you're going to do, for all that you've promised and all that you are is all that has carried me through. Jesus, I thank you. You know, given all that God has done for us, all that he is to us, all the things he's yet to do, it really behooves us to call upon the name of the Lord in an expression of our gratitude. His works in our lives nourish that thankfulness. So what is it we have to be thankful for? Okay, let me state one of the most obvious. 
You can rejoice today over the fact that the date 2022 will not appear on your tombstone. If you are here today, that means you are actually still among the living. Now, there's one or two of you I might want to check your pulse just to make sure, but I think everyone in here is still alive. We can thank God for that. Uh, we can thank God because we still have an opportunity to render loving service to our Lord and to our family and to our church and to fellow humans and to impart faith and encouragement to other people. And we need to do that. We, we still got work to do. You know, as Paul said in Ephesians 5.16, we need to redeem the time. We can be thankful for that. What else can we be thankful for? In 2023. I mean, think about that. What is it that I personally have to be thankful for in 2023? And have you actually thanked God for that? And you know what? If you don't know what it is specifically you need to be thanking God for, let me just encourage you to keep a daily blessings list and watch your thankfulness begin to grow. I was going through a very difficult period. It was back in 2009 after some uh, hurtful lies, particularly hurtful, uh, conflict that uh, a very troublesome man had stirred up in the church. I made the decision to resign from my first pastorate. So, so I was praying and I was waiting for God to show me what was next. But in order to, to help keep my focus on God, my very wise wife uh, challenged me to do something. She challenged me to, to, to make a blessings list, to, to make a daily list of all of the things that God was doing in my life. And so for, for 17 weeks, uh, that's exactly what I did. I made a daily list of the things that God was doing. You know, things as, as simple as, you know, me getting to take the kids to McDonald for lunch or, or something as poignant as a truth that God had revealed to me in my daily reading or, or, or something as big as being gifted a used car. Uh, but it helped me to foster an attitude of gratitude. But in preparation for this sermon uh, on Friday, I actually pulled out that blessings list, all you know, four and a half months worth. And I was reviewing my blessings log, and I noticed this entry from Thursday of week 13. Three, three items on the list that day. $211.25 uh, $211 escrow refund. Okay, that was good. <laughs> Delicious dessert from Nancy Berryman. Now, none of y'all know Nancy, but let me tell you, she made a mean Butterfinger cake. It was epic. Uh, you could write sonnets about this dessert. <laughs> so it was a blessing. But here's the third one on the list. Faith Baptist Church in Texarkana, Arkansas, passed. You see, as I sought sorry, I'll get through this. As I sought to find where God would have me serve next, there were a lot of closed doors, but that was a good thing. I can praise God for that because every closed door, every, every no led me that much closer to the yes. Now, the yes in that particular instance actually ended up, you know, me in a long stint serving South Crest Baptist Church. But in the 13 and a half years since that blessings log entry, I've learned a couple of things. Number one, God uses even our difficulties for His redemptive purposes. In this case, to prepare me for something greater. And number two, I learned that because of that, there is no such thing as a wasted experience. Now, had Faith Baptist Church in Texarkana, Arkansas not passed on me as a candidate all of those years ago, it's highly unlikely that I would be standing right here, right now, in this moment, with all of you in the midst of such a wonderful congregation of people who love God and love each other. And for that reason, I am thankful for the no's that led me to the yes 
in this case, to Beach Street First Baptist Church. Now, I could have looked at that period of my life, uh, you know, that period of waiting, that period of testing. I could have looked at it pessimistically. But you see, Christy helped me to see what God was doing. And little did I know that he was preparing me all those years ago for something that he has for me right here and now. We always have something to thank God for, church. I mean, for those of you who seem to look at life, you know, with the, with the kind of the glass half empty lenses instead of glass half full, I want you to remember this. Even if the Lord never did another thing for us for the rest of our lives, we could still give him thanks because he redeemed us. Because Christ gave his life for us to give us right relationship with God, to give us salvation and eternal life in Jesus. That's something to rejoice about. In fact, when you, when you look at life that way, you realize my glass shouldn't be half full. My glass should be overflowing. So let's carry an attitude of gratitude into 2023. All right, second prayer. Second prayer for new beginnings is the prayer for forgiveness. The prayer for forgiveness. It's a prayer of confession. Listen, let's be real with ourselves. We all need forgiveness from God. Why? Well, so that we can have a, a clean conscience and unhindered fellowship with God. I mean, because let's face it, we're sinners, okay? We're sinners. Just, you know, get on board with that thought right now. We're sinners. The Bible says in Romans 3.10 that there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are flawed human beings who goof up. We have a tendency to do things that displease God, yet He stands ready to forgive us when we will just confess our sin and return to Him. I love the promise of 1 John 1, 9, that if we'll confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Psalm 103.12 says that as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Now, what, is that, what does that mean exactly? I mean, it's very poetic, but what does it mean? That phrase, as far as the east is from the west, it's meant to communicate infinite space. East is in one direction, west is in another direction. East and west will never meet. No matter how far you travel east, you will never reach a point where your next step is going to be westward. So the idea behind that scripture is that when God forgives us, he really forgives. Our sins have been removed as far as possible to imagine. So Psalm 103.12 is really, it's a statement of complete and utter forgiveness. Once our sins have been removed, we'll never be held accountable for them again. In Isaiah 43, 25, God says, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. In fact, there's a very similar promise that God states in Jeremiah uh, 31, 34, a promise that's actually renewed in the New Covenant, in the book of Hebrews, in the New Testament, Hebrews 8, 12, where it says, I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. All right, so what does it mean then when it says that he will remember our sins no more? Well, you see, God's his not remembering, it's not what we would usually think of as forgetfulness because God's omniscient, okay? He knows everything. He forgets nothing. So think of it this way. In human relationships, you know, we, we can choose to remember the offenses someone has committed against us or we can choose to forget those offenses. You see, to forgive someone we often have to put painful memories out of our minds. Now, technically, we don't actually forget the sin. 
you know, it's not that we're unable to recall the offense, but we willfully choose to overlook it because we forget when we don't dwell on those past troubles or those past offenses. Well, in much the same way, God can choose not to remember something. With God, He cleanses us and then He moves on. He doesn't hold our sins against us. Instead, He frees us from the slavery of sin to experience new life. And when we embrace that, then just like King Hezekiah in Isaiah 38, we can say, you have put all of my sins behind my back. In other words, it's all behind us. It's all in the past. Or Morgan Cryer put it very poetically some years ago. He said, what sin? Well, that's as far away as the east is from the west. What sin? It was gone the very minute you confessed, buried in the sea of forgetfulness. So we need to be forgiven by God. But if we're really going to put all that behind us, we also need forgiveness from ourselves. We need to learn to forgive ourselves. And in so doing, learn to forget the failures of our past because they can hinder our witness. They can hinder the work that we do for the Lord in the coming year if we choose to continually dwell on those things. God will both forgive and forget our sins if we will just repent and confess. So if you're having a problem with that, Remember what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because you are now, believer, in Christ, there is no condemnation. No one condemns you. So do not condemn yourself. If anybody's condemning you, it's the devil, because he wants to keep you in an attitude of defeat. Learn to get past your past. Folks, we need to learn to forget a lot of things. Now, some people will let past successes cause them to coast in life. Others let past failures serve as a stumbling block to their potential progress. Well, Paul encouraged the believers at uh, Philippi in Philippians chapter 3 to forget the past and to press on toward the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So let me encourage you, church, to learn to forget your past failures. And instead, as Paul said in Colossians 3, 2, to set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. All right, so the prayers of new beginning include, first of all, the prayer of gratitude. We talked about the prayer of forgiveness. Let's talk about the third one. The third one is the prayer for guidance. The prayer for guidance. This is what we would call a prayer of supplication, or some people would call it a a prayer of petition. What's a prayer of supplication? Uh, In short, it's, it's, it's a prayer of asking. We ask God for something. Now, the requests that we bring to Him, they can be for ourselves or they can be for others. And it's not something that we have a right to demand that God does. It's, you know, a situation where we just approach Him humbly in prayer. Now, that request, it can be for any number of things. It can be for daily needs. It can be for healing. It can be for the salvation of another and so forth. Well, in this case, that prayer of supplication is a prayer for guidance, We're asking for God's leadership in our lives. Now, a month ago, I actually addressed this particular topic in a a sermon called Principles for Perceiving God's Plan for People. And so I'm not going to dwell on that matter extensively in the sermon this morning. In fact, if you missed that service, uh, you can actually watch uh, watch that message online on my YouTube channel. Suffice to say, we must learn to call upon the name of the Lord for wisdom if we are going to walk through the year 2023 in the paths of righteousness. In James chapter 1, James encouraged early Christians that if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives to all generously and ungrudgingly, and it will be given to him. Some years ago in Fort Slocum, New York, a private Solomon from Brooklyn was being questioned by the sergeant. Sarge asked, 
Private Solomon, what's your first name? Solomon, replied Solomon. Ah, oh, wise guy. What's your middle name? Solomon. Now look here, wise guy, the Sarge exploded. And the private was dead serious about it all. His full legal name was actually Solomon, Solomon, Solomon. Now, if this particular Solomon was anything at all like his namesake, he would have been a wise guy indeed. <laughs> Maybe possessing three times the wisdom of, of Solomon. But Christians, if you want wisdom for living in the year 2023, ask for it. That's what the original Solomon did. He asked for it, and God lavished him with wisdom. Uh, you might recall from that sermon last month, we discussed the ways that God actually provides his guidance in our lives. He, more often than not, reveals his will through his word. Sometimes he, he offers guidance through the wise counsel of other believers. Sometimes through the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes he even does it through the, the orchestration of our life's circumstances. But it's not always realistic to expect God's guidance if we are not humble enough to ask for it. But if by faith we daily call upon the Lord and ask for guidance, we can be assured that He will provide it. In Proverbs, King Solomon encouraged us to face the future with an optimistic faith. You know this scripture, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. and all of your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Now, let's be honest with ourselves. Is that straight path always the path of least resistance? No. Because the Christian life is not easy. If anybody ever sold you a bill of goods saying the Christian life was easy, they were either incorrect or they were lying. So it's not always the path of least resistance. Does God reveal His entire plan for our lives all at once? No, that would be pretty overwhelming. But He will instruct us and guide our paths if we trust His wisdom. <clears throat> so the first prayer of new beginning is the prayer of gratitude. The second prayer of new beginning is that prayer for forgiveness. The third is the prayer for guidance. Now, here's the fourth one. The prayer for help. Okay, now this is also a prayer of supplication. It's us asking. Let me give you a, just a quick bit of advice. It won't cost you a thing, church. Don't ever be too proud to ask God for help. Okay, that's my two cents worth. Don't ever think that your need is so small that shouldn't bother the Lord with your petitions because He wants you to call upon Him. He wants you to make your declaration of dependence. You know why? Because He knows that your dependence on Him will draw you into a deeper, more trusting, more intimate relationship with Him. Uh, 94 times in the Bible, if you just if you do a search of the words call upon or call on, 94 times in the Bible you'll find those words. Now I know a lot of you like the Psalms, and part of the beauty of the Psalms is their ability uh, to teach us how to express ourselves to God. And so David and, and some of the other psalmists, they had no reservation about calling upon the name of the Lord in a time of need. In fact, 21 times in the Psalms alone you will find that word combination, call upon or called upon. Uh, Psalm 18.3, I called to the Lord who is worthy of praise and I was saved from my enemies. We need to call upon the name of the Lord. 1 Chronicles 16.8, Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. We are expected to call upon the name of the Lord. Okay, so as we're calling upon the name of the Lord, uh, what sort of help are we asking Him for? Now, there's a lot of answers to that question. I'm going to give you two. All right. First of all, help for sustaining. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11. We pray for sustenance. We pray for, for life, for health. We pray for the very breath in our lungs. 
And after all, uh, according to Paul, for in him we live and move and have our being. That's uh, Acts 17, 28. And when Paul said in Colossians 1, 17, that Christ is before all things, and by him all things hold together, the all things that he's talking about, that includes you and me. He holds us together. He is the one who sustains you. And apart from him, you can do nothing, Jesus said in John 15, 5. So we need to call upon the name of the Lord, not just for sustaining, but also help for serving. We call upon him for help for serving. Folks, we are saved to serve. Do you get that? I mean, most of us realize what we've been saved from. We've been saved from the eternal consequences of sin. We've been, we've been saved from a, a life of slavery to sin. But we don't always remember what we're saved to. Yes, we're saved to eternal life, but we're also saved to serve. Saving faith is behaving faith. But here's the thing. Our service to the church, our service to the Lord, it can only be sustained in His strength. I mean, there's a lot of people in the church today who serve the Lord, and they, they start out, you know, eagerly, uh, energetically, but they either, um, either, you know, whether it's a pastor who serves uh, vocationally or a, just a, a volunteer, a layperson who serves in a volunteer status, you see a lot of people crash and burn. You see a lot of people flame out. Now, why is that? Well, most likely because they're trying to sustain themselves in their own power and strength. And let me tell you, if you're trying to serve the Lord in your own ability, your own wisdom, your own power and strength, you might go along pretty well for a while, but eventually you're going to stumble. Here's the thing, though. God never calls us to anything that He won't enable us in the power of His Holy Spirit to be able to accomplish. But we've got to trust that. We've got to trust in that strength, understanding that He is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to His power that is at work within us. That's Ephesians 3.20. You see, the power of the Holy Spirit, it's not just a source of enjoyment. It's a force for employment. We should be asking Him for power to serve. I mean, do, do you want to put that power to work? Then ask for it. I mean, we, we need that power for, for life, for, for ministry. We need it for help as we partner with God and calling others to salvation in Jesus because there is a multitude of people out there who don't know Christ as their personal Savior. They have not discovered the joy of being the children of God and having a relationship with Him. They've never experienced that gift of new life. They're still in their sins. They're still wandering away from God. They are lost. And so they need to hear the gospel both from our lips, but also from seeing its results in our lives so that they can be encouraged by the Spirit of God to come to our Savior in this year to come. So are we, are we up to that task? Well, we will be if we call upon Him. Paul wrote to the uh, Christians in Rome and assured them that the Lord richly blesses all who call upon Him. That's Romans 10, 12. And we have that privilege to call on Him. It is freely available to us. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16 says that because Jesus is our high priest, meaning He is our mediator, He is the go-between between humankind and God, it says, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace in time of need. As we pray that prayer for help. You really want to see change in 2023? Humble yourself before God. Admit His greatness. Thank Him for that. Acknowledge your failures before Him. Then ask for His leadership and for His assistance. Start praying the prayers of new beginning. And 
folks, it's not rocket science. It, it's pretty simple. You know, we pray that prayer of gratitude. We pray that prayer for forgiveness. We pray that prayer for guidance. We pray the prayer for help. As we see here in Genesis chapter 4, because of the godly family line of Seth, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Well, you know, as people of God, we too would do well to begin each year, really to begin each and every day by calling upon the name of the Lord. Now, if you don't have a particularly vibrant prayer life, uh, let me suggest, you know, just give you a, a pointer or two. Uh, if you don't really know what to pray during your prayer time, I would suggest you use the, uh, the ACTS approach. It's an acronym, A-C-T-S. A for adoration, uh, C for confession, T for thanksgiving, S for supplication. Okay, adoration. We spend time praising God for who He is. But then, confession. We confess our sin to Him, and we ask for Him to cleanse us. Then thanksgiving. We thank Him for all the things that He has done for us and all the things He's going to do. And then supplication. Those are the prayers where we ask God for something, either to meet our own needs or as we intercede for somebody else who, who needs their needs met. You know, whether it's someone who's really struggling, someone who needs salvation, someone who needs healing. ACTS, Acts, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication. Church, we've got to live 2023 one day at a time. So let's rejoice over the opportunity that we have to call upon the name of the Lord. Let's rejoice in that privilege in the year 2023, every day. Because prayer is a privilege. It is a, a blessing, one to take advantage of. May our earnest prayer be like that, the, the prayer of St. Richard of Chichester, he wrote so many years ago, Thanks be to thee, my Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits thou hast given me, for all the pains and insults thou hast borne for me. O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, and follow thee more nearly, day by day. Believers, Let's make every day something new. Let's pray the prayers of new beginnings every day.